Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for having me here. It's always fun to be with all of you. And congratulations on your graduation and accomplishments. And uh, I hope everyone knows how they got here. You do? Let's see this video for three minutes. Tells you how you really got here. Okay. So you made it. Congratulations. <laughs> At the moment of conception, you acquire 25,000 genes, half from your father and half from your mother. A gene is a stretch of DNA that codes for a protein. In fact, some genes code for more than one protein. 
which are the first units of life. And the proteins also have enzymes. So once you get going, you create a whole body out of it. 25,000 genes, but one cell. It's called a zygote, a fertilized cell. It becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. At the end of about 50 replications, you have 100 trillion cells, which is more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. This process is called morphogenesis and differentiation. So morphogenesis means to give rise to form, and differentiation, how the one cell becomes the 100 trillion cells. Everything from heart to brain to kidney to fingernails to genitalia to spleen to liver, all from that one cell. The process by which this happens is now thought to be epigenetic, which means that it's the intergenic DNA that's actually regulating this process. Only 2% of your DNA codes for proteins or for actually what happens, you know, the, the whole process. But the rest of the DNA, 98%, is silent behind the scenes, You're regulating what to turn off, what to turn on, what to increase the intensity, which activity needs to be increased, which activity needs to be decreased. As you saw in the video, it said, if the baby kept growing at this rate, it could be 1.5 tons. So there's some kind of self-regulation, self-organization happening. Try to remember this word, self, self. Self-organizing itself into you. Now, DNA, which codes ultimately all of life, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and these are four chemical bases. Four chemical bases, usually abbreviated into four letters, A, T, C, G. Adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, but most people just say ATCG. So ATCG are the four letters of life. When I'm speaking English right now, I'm accessing 26 letters. We need 26 letters for this language, for us to communicate. But the language of life is only four letters. It doesn't matter what that life form is. Okay, four letters arranged differently into words. Think of genes as words that become the flesh, metaphorically speaking. Okay, so word, genes are words that become the flesh. And DNA is the letters that you use to make those words. 65% of your genes are the same as a banana. About 75% of your genes are the same as a fruit fly. That's why scientists can look at fruit flies and talk about how what they learn applies to human beings. 80% of your genes are the same as a mouse. Almost 99% of your genes are the same as a chimpanzee. Less than maybe about 1% difference between you and a chimpanzee. It's just the arrangement. So your, what's your body? Your body is a story. Woven together using four letters and 25,000 words. That's it. Now what about those letters? What about A, T, C, and G? What are they made of? They're made of the elements. In fact, 96% of the elements in your body are just four, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. If you want to remember the acronym, it's CHON, C-H-O-N, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. 
The remaining 4% of the elements in your body are just about all the other elements on the periodic table. So calcium, which is important for your bones, phosphorus, also in your bones, and many other chemical reactions in your body, sulfur. Where did these atoms come from? These atoms were forged in the crucible of burning stars that are called supernova. A supernova is a giant star which is much bigger than, say, our sun, which is a bit relatively small star. So supernova are huge stars. When they start to exhaust their thermonuclear energy, and they start burning down into the heat death of absolute zero, then simple elements that were formed 14 billion years ago, or a little about then, hydrogen and helium, they start to fuse, it's called nuclear fusion, and that becomes the elements that are now in your body. Today, scientists estimate, and by the way, you don't have to believe anything I say. You can check it out. These days, easy to check out everything. Today, current model of science says that there are two trillion galaxies in the universe. Two trillion galaxies in the universe. Current science also tells us that there might be 700 sextillion stars. I don't even know how to write that. Okay? 700 sextillion stars. And current scientific models tell us that there are probably 100 billion habitable planets in our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy which has 100 billion stars, but right next door to us is something called Andromeda, then Virgo, and keep going on till you get to two trillion <laughs> galaxies. Why am I sharing this with you? Because your body right now, the elements in your body come from different galaxies your body and the fact that you're sitting here listening to this lecture is a conspiracy of the total universe from the beginning of time. Mathematically precise so that you have a mind, a body and an experience. If anything was missing by just one decimal point, there would be no existence as we know it. So by now, if you're not totally astonished, totally overwhelmed, totally bewildered, and totally grateful that you exist, then what's the point? Right? Astonishment, bewilderment, humility, reverence for existence, are the holiest of holiest modes of spiritual experience. There's no reason for why this should be so. Now, during the nine months that it takes to make a human baby, your body goes through all the stages of evolution, biological evolution. So there's a history of cosmological evolution, cosmic evolution, and there is a history of biological evolution. So you replicate the experience morphogenetically, which means as form, of all living species. You start out first looking like a microbe, and then you start to look like a reptile. You have a reptile, a reptilian brain. It's called the midbrain. And then you form a limbic brain, which is also referred to as the emotional brain. So limbic brain is also referred to as the 
mammalian brain. The word mammal comes from the word mama, which means breast, mammary. And so mammals are so called because they don't give, they don't lay eggs, they give birth to babies, they make babies. And they breastfeed and they nurture and they love and they make bodily contact, they kiss, they coo, they cuddle, they whisper sweet things to each other, they even lick. All mammals also play. Not just human beings, in fact, human beings are losing the ability to play. But if you look at monkeys, you look at rabbits, you look at dolphins, they all play with their young. Also, all mammals sing. I don't know if you knew that, but all mammals sing. So mammals bond with emotions. And this part of our brain is a very important part of our brain because emotions regulate our biology. The reptilian brain, which is, you know, if I, if I show you my hand like this, this would be a handy model of the brain. Handy model of the brain. <laughs> this would be the spinal cord. This is where my, my thumb is. This would be the reptilian brain, which protects us from basically danger. It's also called the instinctive brain. So in a threatening situation, we either fight or we run or we freeze. And uh, this uh, brain has enhanced survival through a very primitive response, which now, if it's inappropriate, we call it stress. Okay, but it goes back 300 million years in evolutionary time. The limbic brain, the emotional brain, is only 100 million years old. And it is the emotional brain or the limbic brain which is connected to everything that's happening in our body. So your limbic brain, you know, you've heard words like I'm sure amygdala, hypothalamus, pituitary. So this part of your brain is influenced by your emotions. And if you are experiencing love, compassion, joy, equanimity, gratitude, then through the connections of the limbic brain with the endocrine system, with the pituitary, with all the other endocrine organs in the body, with um, the uh, connection of the emotional limbic brain through the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, regulating your heartbeat, your heart rate variability, the activity in your microbiome, this is all done by your emotional brain or limbic brain. If you're feeling fear, intense anxiety, hostility, anger, guilt, shame, depression, um, then those unhealthy emotions that disconnect you from life, they cause distress and that's the beginning of chronic illness. All starts with fear and depression. We're beginning to understand this for the first time, how that happens. So that's the emotional brain, and then you have the cortical brain, which is the bulk of the brain. So if I open my hand, that was the limbic brain. Now, this bulk of the brain is called the cortical brain. It's also referred to as the intellectual brain. And it's only four million years old. And it grew explosively when we started to use language, which started what is called the cognitive revolution, about 50,000 years ago, but it only grew really rapidly in the last 5,000 years when we also started to write, symbolically represented our thoughts so we could communicate with each other and tell each other stories. Basically, that's a human adventure, telling stories around experiences. So the stories may be mythical stories, they may be religious stories, they may be theological stories, they may be philosophical stories, and today they are scientific stories. Are they true? Well, they are true if you're embedded in the story. We know old stories slowly get dismantled and new stories come back. This is a never-ending 
adventure of human consciousness. So in any case, there's a chain of existence that goes back to the beginning of time. There's a chain of existence, there's a chain of being through all of cosmological and biological existence. If there was one missing link in this chain, we wouldn't be here. Okay. For 13.8 billion years, an unbroken sequence of events in the chain of being with no missing link. Now, when it comes time to enter the world, as the baby comes out of the womb into the world, uh, something very interesting happens, especially when it's not a cesarean or it's a normal delivery. As the baby comes out, even if it's cesarean, to some extent this happens, but uh, in a natural birth, the baby swallows, inhales, and is covered by the vaginal secretions of its mother. So it swallows them, and it inhales them. And of course, it's covered by them. And this results in the implantation of what is now called the second genome. Remember, I told you that you got 25,000 genes, human genes from your parents. But at the moment of birth, you are inoculated by 2 million to 20 million, depending on which part of the world you live in. There's a second inoculation, and it's called the microbiome. So this microbiome is right now present in your skin. It's present in your mouth. It's in your ears, in your eyes, in your urethra, in the vagina, in everywhere there's an opening in this in the body, it's there. It's in the stomach, it's in the colon, it's everywhere. So technically speaking, you're a few human cells hanging on to a bacterial colony. <laughs> the bacterial mass in your body is only three pounds. It's the same thing as your brain. But the genetic information in your body, 99% of it is the microbiome. You cannot change the genes you got from your parents. It's like a deck of cards that was dealt when you were conceived. Although now we know that you can modify the activity of the human genes. So think of genes as the lights in this room. There's so many lights, the blue light and red lights and all kinds of colors of lights chandelier, this, that, and the other, and think of a computer somewhere in the back that can control these lights, can control the activities of these lights, which are your genes. So your genes can be turned on, so you can turn on some lights, turn off the other lights if you want. You can dim certain lights and you can increase the intensity of the other lights. And this is called epigenetics. And it's influenced by how we live our life. Epigenetics. You can't change the human genes, but you can change their expression. However, you can change your microbial genes. And we'll see how. You can change the population of your microbial genes. And remember, that's 99% of the genetic information in your body. So this integration of what we call genomics, the genes you inherited, the microbiome, the genes you acquire through food and through contact with other people, particularly your parents, right in the beginning when you were born, that's the microbial genes. And then epigenetics is the regulation of this interaction, this inter integration between the three brains, the reptilian brain, the emotional brain, the intellectual brain, and also the integration between genes, microbiome, and epigenetics. This is what causes a human body to self-regulate itself. 
So, of course, the mystery is what is this self that is regulating itself? Okay. When did it show up? Did it show up at the moment of conception? Was it there in the beginning, right when the universe was created? Questions for another time, but we will try and address this a little bit. I think the first thing to understand, and you would understand this because you know, you're part of this institution that um, is talking about integration. So the way to understand this is to look at your body as an integrated system. To look at your body as an integrated holistic system, which is part of a larger system, which we call the universe. You cannot separate yourself from the universe. If you did, where would you go? Okay. <laughs> you and the universe are a single activity in space and time. And this is a diagram that shows the integration of the brain to consciousness, to the endocrine system, to the limbic emotional brain through the vagus nerve, the connection to both the uh, activities of the autonomic nervous system. You see that vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve and it's coming from your brain. It's coming from your brain, midbrain. It regulates your heart rate variability, pierces the diaphragm, and then regulates the activity of every organ in the body, almost every organ in the body. And it even pierces the, di it pierces the intestines and influences the microbiome. So this emotional brain is regulating the endocrine system. It's also regulating uh, the, uh, the autonomic nervous system. And then there are peptides being produced by the microbiome that influence the immune system which is your T-cells, B-cells, macrophages that protect you from cancer and infection. It's all one self-regulating system. Now, in medicine, the way we are trained, of course, is we look at the parts. So we divide the body into parts, which is kind of an artificial um, division because your heart can't function without the brain, your brain can't function without the heart, and the heart can't function without the nutrients coming from your stomach, and the nutrients are influenced by the microbiome in your gut. So it's all one thing. Okay. When we understand the body as a holistic, integrated system, and even don't need think about the parts, because the parts are actually confusing. You know, you look at the parts and you divide them into smaller parts, molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, and then they all disappear into waves of probability in what is called the quantum vacuum. And you're left again with the whole system. So there are no parts. Parts are, in a way, just patterns of behavior of the whole. Okay? Patterns of activity of the whole. So with this kind of basic background, let's look at some of the most important things you can do to maintain well-being. And before I even go there, I would like to tell you that only 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant. Going back to our metaphor, the elements are stardust. The elements in your body are stardust. Okay. DNA is the alphabet. Genes are the words. And your body is a story. And the body is a story of the whole universe. Now, anytime you write a story, and you know, I have a lot of experience with this writing books and stories, inevitably there are some mistakes. They're called typos. 
okay? And in our current language of genetics, these mistakes, these genetic mistakes are called mutations. A mutation is a genetic error. So maybe the word is upside down, maybe the letter is missing, or maybe the letter is in the wrong sequence. You know, we make those typos all the time when we write stories. Well, the universe also makes a few mistakes now and then. And in our current language, we call them mutations. Now, this is what I want to tell you, which is very important. Only 5% of these genetic mistakes, only 5% of these genetic mutations that are connected to illness are fully penetrant, which means that they predict the disease. In fact, it may be much less than 5%, it may be 3%. So when you look at any disease, chronic illness that's related to genetics, you'll see that Let's say you're looking at Alzheimer's, there are almost like 30 to 40 genetic mutations that are connected to Alzheimer's, but only three or four are fully penetrant. If you look at cancer, then you'll see that uh, there are hundreds of mutations that are connected to cancer. Hundreds. But only three or four percent of them are fully penetrant, which means they predict you that if somebody has that gene mistake, they're going to get that particular disease. Now, a famous example of this is, of course, Angelina Jolie, who had the BRCA gene, which was going to predict breast cancer, so she had a mastectomy as a prevention. In the next 10 years, by the way, even that won't be necessary because as technology advances, we'll be able to cut and paste genes, just like you when you send your email to somebody or you can cut and paste. So you'll be able to delete some genes that are harmful and you'll be able to paste the genes that are beneficial. This is going to happen. It's already happening in, in experiments. It's called CRISPR technology, the editing of genes. But even when that happens, that will only influence 3% to 5% of chronic illness. The rest depends on how you live your life. Okay, so this is very important to understand scientifically. Okay, so given that, here are the six most important things you can do to self-regulate your body. It's just these six. The first is getting a good night's sleep every day without uh, intoxicants or drugs. I remember when I was a resident, one night I got up to go to the restroom and I heard my nurse, she was screaming at a patient, Mr. Smith, will you please wake up? I have to give you your sleeping pill. <laughs> so <laughs> I went up to her and I said, you're waking this poor guy up in order to give him a sleeping pill. And she said, yes, because I know he'll wake up in 15 minutes, then uh, he'll wake me up, and then I'll wake you up. I said, no, please give him the sleeping pill. <laughs> and that's how we were trained. We were trained more for the convenience of our selves than of our patients. And since then, I learned that in most hospitals, 90% of the prescriptions are for five things. Pain, anxiety, nausea, insomnia and constipation. If you want to remember that, the acronym is PANIC. Okay? 90% of all prescriptions are related to basically anxiety or stress manifesting as constipation or insomnia or nausea or whatever. Nausea, of course, is due to a lot of drugs too. So good sleep. And what happens during sleep is many very interesting things happen. So only recently have scientists gotten really interested in sleep. In sleep, what happens is the fluctuations of consciousness that we call the waking state. This is, I hope everyone's in the waking state right now. 
Okay? These are the fluctuations of consciousness that are causing this experience. But in many wisdom tr traditions of the world, the waking state is merely a lucid dream that consciousness is having. The waking state is the lucid dream that your soul is experiencing right now. Because this is a lucid dream. If I asked you what happened to your childhood, the answer is, it's gone. What happened to yesterday? The answer is, it's gone. What happened to this morning? It's gone. What happened to five minutes ago? It's gone. What happened to when I entered the room? What happens to these words by the time you hear them? It's gone. So experience, that which we call experience, is ungraspable. You can't grasp it. Can't catch it. Before you can catch it, it's not there. That's why the great German philosopher, Wittgenstein, he said, we are asleep. Our life is a dream. But once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. The Buddha said something similar when he said this lifetime is transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance. A lifetime is like a flash of lightning in the sky, rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. So what do we wake up to? What are we trying to wake up to is our spirit, our soul, that is having this lucid dream in a vivid now. Now is not a moment in time. Have you ever seen now showing up from there, leave, followed by another now? <laughs> it's a human construct. Now is the lucid, vivid, eternal, timeless being projecting this dream that we call the waking state. Now at night, something very interesting happens in that those vibrations or those fluctuations of consciousness go more subtle, so you have what you call the dream, which is a way of cleaning up both the emotional body and the physical body. And then you go into deep sleep when there's no experience, but you're still there. Awareness is still there. So every 24 hours, we go through this cycle of birth, death, dream, and life, every 24 hours. What we call the waking dream or is just basically consciousness recycling its dreams and having new dreams. But on a physiological level, what happens is during both these phases, the dream sleep and the deep sleep state, amyloid starts to get flushed out of your brain, your endocrine system repairs itself, the immune cells refresh themselves, and then in the morning, if you've had a good sleep, you say, I slept like a baby. Because you're as fresh as a baby is that has showed up from the unmanifest. Okay. So do not underestimate the value of sleep. It's the most efficient way to experiencing a joyful, energetic body a loving, compassionate heart, a clear, reflective mind, and just lightness of being. Sleep is a return to the memory of where we came from, the unmanifest consciousness that likes to manifest this, which we call reality. But it has amazing physiological benefits. Okay, the second thing, and these are not necessarily in order of importance, they're all equally important, is meditation and stress management. Now, meditation has become very popular recently with the word mindfulness is on everyone's tongue. Meditation, of course, helps you manage stress. Meditation allows the mind to get quiet, and when the mind gets quiet, the body gets quiet, and when the body gets quiet, it self-regulates itself. This is what we call homeostasis. Homeostasis is self-regulation. 
But as you, as you look at the literature and meditation from all the traditions of the world, you'll see that meditation is actually much more than that. Meditation is self-reflection, self-inquiry, it is transcendence, it is being aware of experience as it happens, this experience as it happens, if you're aware of it, the experience of the five senses, the experience of the body, the experience of what we call mental space, the witnessing of emotions, the witnessing of choices, what can be called metacognition. Metacognition is to be aware of experience consciously as it's happening, but also be aware of, of the choices you make as you make them. And when you do that, then there's um, dramatic effects on your body. All the genes that cause self-regulation go up. Some 17-fold over baseline. All the genes that cause too much inflammation and disease, they go down. And the levels of an enzyme called telomerase, which determines how long you live at the genetic clock, the levels of the enzyme go up significantly, like 40% in less than a week. So meditation is the perfect way to reset your biological clock, to also regulate your genes, and to enhance the quality and the length of your life. All this has been published now, it's not just us, but many other institutions. Meditation changes your neural networks, it causes Gene, uh, genes that create neurons to go up in their activity, so it causes neurogenesis. It also causes synaptogenesis, which it means it enhances the connections that cause the integration between your reptilian brain, your emotional brain, and your intellectual brain. A lot of good research in the last 10 years in this area. The third thing I mention here is movement, but also a bench in here, of course, one of the reasons I'm moving right now is I still haven't done my 10,000 steps, <laughs> but I also mentioned here yoga and pranayama. How many people practice some form of yoga, pranayama? Wonderful. So when you practice yoga and pranayama, you're actually stimulating the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve and other visceral nerves, the vagus nerve in English, is related to the English word vagabond. Vagus is a Latin uh, term. It's your 10th cranial nerve that goes from your brain, your midbrain, influences the tone of your voice. So these days one can do voice analysis and, and actually predict if somebody is stressed or happy or drunk or having a hangover. That's influenced by your vagal tone. It then influences your heart rate variability, which is the best predictor of whether you're healthy or sick. Heart rate variability means the variability between heartbeat and heartbeat. If you're stressed, then everything is very fixed, like an army going to war. But if you're going with the flow, then your vagal tone changes your heart rate, the interval between your heartbeat and heartbeat, because it's going with the flow. So you have maximum flexibility. Well, the, when you practice yoga, you stimulate the vagus nerve and other afferent nerves that are responsible for self-regulation, including your microbiome. Because remember, the vagus nerve goes and influences the microbiome, and if the microbiome is inflamed, then the rest of the body will be inflamed. Number four there is emotions. So in this understanding, we divide emotions into healthy emotions that connect you to life, such as love, compassion, empathy, joy, playfulness, gratitude, equanimity, and peace. And then the opposite of those, fear, hostility, anger, guilt, shame, depression, which cause disruption of homeostasis and inflammation in the body. We also now know that on almost every chronic illness, there's a background of low-grade inflammation. Acute inflammation protects you. So if I, 
If I injure myself and have a bruise, that's acute inflammation, and that prevents me from bleeding to death. Or if I encounter a pneumococcus and my body produces an inflammatory response through the immune system, that's protective. But then when there's low-grade inflammation, you're not even aware of it. You might just feel a little tired or out of sorts, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of low-grade depression, and you know, you go to see a doctor, they say there's nothing wrong with you. Because low-grade inflammation cannot be picked up. Now it can. By the way, there are blood tests called inflammatory markers that we can measure now. And we had just finished a study that showed in chronic heart failure patients, if they kept a gratitude journal every night, all their inflammatory markers went down and their brain changed. There's no drug in the world that can do that. No drug in the world that can do that. Okay. So the fifth thing here that is mentioned is nutrition, <clears throat> which is, of course, very important for all of you here uh, in this holistic framework. Now, I have to confess, when I was a resident, when I was uh, training in medicine, and if a patient told me that they changed their diet and their asthma went away, or they changed their diet and their arthritis went away, or they changed their diet and they had a remission, I didn't believe them. I had no framework for understanding this. How could changing a diet reverse a chronic illness? And then Dr. Dean Ornish started showing that in heart disease, and now we know that this is actually theoretically true for every disease. Okay, so when you eat a diet that is natural, that is not processed, that food does not come from a factory, not manufactured, not processed, not refined, not with concentrated sugar, but directly from the earth, even if you are not a vegetarian, if you're eating, although plant-based foods are the healthiest, but even if you're eating a meat diet, if the livestock is not fed, hormones, chemicals, antibiotics, and pesticides, which are all petroleum products, then your microbiome will be healthy if your food is natural. If it comes closer from the energy of the sun, because plant-based foods have a lot of energy from what we call phytochemicals. Phyto means light, chemicals, chemicals made from the light of the sun, which is our direct connection to life and the stars and the cosmos. So changing your diet will change your microbial activity, which is 99% of the genes in your body within a few days. Within a few days, you will have a totally different gene expression. 99% of the genetic information in your body will have changed. We didn't know this before, but today we do. So uh, the more contaminated your food is, the more likely you are to have dysbiosis. And now dysbiosis means an unhealthy microbiome and therefore unhealthy body, inflamed body. And the final thing I mention here is, um, is uh, something that has to do with our biological rhythms. So we have four kinds of biological rhythms in our body. The first is the circadian rhythm, which is a biological rhythm we have in our body as the earth spins on its axis. The second is the seasonal rhythm as the earth goes around the sun. The third is the lunar rhythm, which is the relationship of the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth to each other. And the fourth is the tidal rhythm, which is the ocean tides. Now, all these rhythms are in our body because we are part of the universe. We are an activity of the universe. So there's an ocean inside you, which is the same as the ocean outside. And you have tidal rhythms. You have circadian rhythms. If you have jet, jet lag, it's just a disruption in circadian rhythms. But if you have direct contact with nature, like if you're walking barefoot 
on the ground or the earth, or you're walking barefoot on the beach, or <clears throat> you're walking on grass, then you reset your circadian rhythms. Also, what happens is negative ions come from the earth into your body and they neutralize the excess free radicals that build up in your body as a result of stress. So this has now gained a lot of attention and we are doing a lot of research in what we call grounding. Every time you ground yourself, you decrease inflammation in the body. And because your body, the circadian rhythms are linked to all the other rhythms in the world, you reset your biological rhythms. Okay, let me show you just a couple of very interesting slides. So this is a thermogram that shows the effects of grounding, uh, an inflamed thermogram, and then you see on the other side, so you see this uh, after grounding, and um, this is before grounding, and this is a grounding mat on a bed. So you take the mat and you connect it through the grounding wire to the earth. These things, the devices are easily available now on the internet, and you can also check out our, um, our website, jio.com, and you can find more information and research on this grounding. Also, recently, through artificial intelligence techniques, it's possible to measure your microbiome. So you can actually take a stool sample and you can send it to one of many companies. This is the one that we work with, viome.com slash perfect health. And uh, you can get your stool examined for the microbiome and find out which foods are the most healthy for you. So, you know, we now in this, this group, we all know that diet, no diet is universal. That's why you're studying integrative diet, right? No diet is universal. People say, well, spinach is very healthy, asparagus is very healthy. But what if you don't have the enzyme to metabolize oxalate, then spinach will give you kidney stones, right? But now we can understand how that does that. You can look at the microbiome, you can find out which foods are healthy, which are not, change your microbiome, retest it. And at the same time, test inflammatory markers in the body. Okay, if you want to look up the research, it, you can just go to our website, choprafoundation.org. Nonprofit website, choprafoundation.org. And you can look up all the research that is happening in these amazing areas of integrative health, well-being, and integrative medicine. So I have discussed everything now, except for the fact that as human beings, we have other issues. <laughs> Humans are complicated. So if you kick a dog, the dog also has memory, and you meet that dog five years later, it might attack you. But unlike a human being, it won't plan for five years how to get even. <laughs> so we have what we call the misuse of our imagination. And the biggest misuse of our imagination is fear. And the best use of our imagination is creativity. And where does this come from? This comes from our own conditioned mind. How we've been conditioned since we were born, through society, through our parents, through history, through economics, through mythology, through religion, we all acquire a conditioned mind. And that conditioned mind can lead to lots of dilemmas, including the fact that as human beings, we have forms of suffering that other species do not have. We worry about old age. We worry about infirmity. We worry about the inevitable, which is death. And so great spiritual traditions have tried to focus on the spiritual causes of human suffering. 
So um, the word klesha is a Sanskrit word, which means human suffering. And this has led to all kinds of spiritual inquiry into how do we go beyond the great fears that we have. And so this is something that wisdom traditions speak about. They say all human suffering comes from not knowing the true nature of your own being, not knowing the true nature of reality. We confuse reality with this experience. This is an experience we're having. Your body is an experience that you're having, right? Your body was once a baby, once a toddler, once a teenager, what's now, and you know, in a few years, it'll disappear. Okay, so that creates a lot of fear because you identify yourself not with the consciousness in which the experience is happening. The most common word we use is, in any language is I. I was in Los Angeles yesterday. I went to a Chinese restaurant. I was born in India. I am a physician. Is I is the non-changing factor in every experience. And yet, most people don't know what I is. So the spiritual tradition says that leads to grasping and clinging at something that cannot be grasped. We already said that. A dream cannot be grasped. It leads to the fear of impermanence and ultimately a false identity that doesn't have any existence, called the ego, and finally, the fear of death. And so all these traditions also tell us that truth is contained in the first cause, not knowing the true nature of reality. So with that, I'd like to actually share a little technique with you and uh, maybe that'll give us a little insight into what I'm saying. So I'm going to ask you a question, and the answer to the question is yes. Okay? The question is, are you aware right now? More enthusiasm. Are you aware right now? Yes. Good. Now I'm going to ask you the same question, but don't answer it till I raise my hand. Everybody got that? Okay, so don't answer it till I raise my hand. Are you aware? Yes. Are you aware is a thought. The answer yes is a thought. In between is you, awareness. So I'm asking you the same question. This time, don't answer it at all. Just turn your attention to being aware. Be aware not only of that which is listening, but that which is seeing, that is aware of this body, of this room, of others here. Just turn back and be present to the awareness in which this experience is happening. Don't answer my question. Are you aware? This still presence is your innermost being. And it is not in time. Experience is in time. The experience of the body is in time. The experience of the mind is in time. The experience that we are having right now is in time. But that which is having the experience is timeless. In the Vedic tradition, when speaking of this, we say water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot shatter it, fire cannot burn it, it is ancient, it is unborn, 
and it does not know death. This is the only identity that we have that is not provisional. Everything else is provisional, comes and goes. So, as the great Sufi poet Rumi said, God's language is silence. Everything else is poor translation. Thank you.